Thank you for giving us this opportunity to uh, share with yourselves a brief history of Islamic metalwork over the centuries. This talk is the first in a series of talks which will be held over California in the coming months. My name is uh, Mohammed Khalik and I'm visiting the USA with the purpose of generating interest in Islamic art, especially Islamic metal and I revive an interest in Islamic art, and I'll be holding these talks with my colleague, Dr. Eamon Salim, who's right here. The medium to be discussed will be in metal only, uh, and the reason for this will be explained uh, further on in the talk. <coughs> if we look around across the Islamic world, and the, and the world in general, we feel a dangerous and pervasive myth has arisen, and this and risks becoming accepted norm and reality unless we challenge this myth. And this myth, we feel, is namely that the Islamic world never really espoused art and that art and Islam cannot be synonymous. From the destruction of Islamic buildings and mosques, many with incredible history, to the looting and selling of artifacts with careless abandonment, and whether it be Arab Springs or horrific wars, the damage done to Islamic heritage is only overshadowed by the tragic loss of vast numbers of human lives and miseries exacted on countless others. It's as though Muslims have fallen into a cycle of desperation and hopelessness, almost like self-inflicted pain and harm and mutilation. On the other hand, and furthermore, if you care to read anti-Islamic blogs on the internet, you can easily find a rewriting of history by the enemies of Islam. For example, the Muslims are violent. They are not educated. Their religion espouses only violence. They are a culture less people, barbaric and uncivilized. These are comments are taken on the internet. Devoid of beauty and sophistication. Some authors have even written and, and tried to rewrite history and taken away the important place of Islam in the world's technological and cultural developments by instigating false rumors 
that many Islamic achievements in the past were not created by Muslims, but by non-Muslims. For, for example, the Taj Mahal or the great mosques of Turkey, it's been said recently that these were done by non-Muslims. At the other end of the uh, spectrum, a more sympathetic and sophisticated but still patronizing view by art historians and ac academics tells us that Islamic history had its zenith around the time of Harun al-Rashid and its demise more or less came around the 1500s, the 16th century. And whilst the present being described as Islamic history is nadir. So i.e. we were brilliant at the time of Harun al-Rashid and then after that it's all been downhill and around the 16th century after that nothing. There's nothing in Islamic history, there's nothing in culture, nothing. This is from the most sophisticated kind of academics rather than the kind of the people who just hate Islam for the sake of it. <clears throat> However, we feel that nothing could be further from the truth. And we all need to look within our deen and find admiration for beauty is espoused by Islam throughout history. Indeed, from the Sunnah of Muhammad the Prophet, to countless ayahs and surahs from the Quran, we can see that Allah permeates beauty in all his creations and the universe and within the hearts of mankind. Here you'll see some selection of uh, quotes uh, from the Quran and ayahs and uh, hadith. <coughs> As you can see, I mean these are just a handful. There's literally thousands of points in the Quran and, and obviously in the Hadiths and in Islamic history which point to beauty and logic and plan better than anything that mankind can create on earth. So this thing, this notion that Islam has had no civilization or has been, has been barbaric all along is obviously a, a vicious false rumor and as I said from the start of this lecture that's something that we want to challenge. And as regards to desperation and losing hope, you know, we know well throughout the Islamic world, Allah commands us to never lose hope. We must always be in accordance with the highest noble standards set out for us within Islam and not become barbaric or devoid of humanity, no matter how bad things can get. Okay, moving on to the metal work. The artisans within Islamic lands, imbued with the beauty of Islam's message, were quick to produce stunning artistic masterpieces in many forms and mediums and many formats which had the unique spirit of Islam within them. From majestic mosques to breathtaking calligraphy, there have been no bounds to Islamic artistry and its beauty. At the same time, across vast regions of the Islamic empire, the similarities and the richness within the Islamic faith had continuity within all forms of art. Metalwork was and is no exception, and this material in particular lent itself to becoming the epitome of Islamic art, only second to the masterful pen strokes of the greatest Quranic calligraphers. Indeed, metal had three qualities and connotations which were greatly valued by the Muslims. If you look here, which is strength, metal being strong and powerful was metaphorical for Islam and its strengths of value, honor, valor, dignity, justice, and the strength of belief in the magnanimity of Allah Almighty, the glorious, the exalted, the most high. In illumination, the brilliance and, the brilliance and reflectiveness of Islamic metal Again, the brightness of Islam was a metaphor for the nur of Islam and the light within and outside. The purity without equal, the radiance of Iman, the glory of Allah, the nur of the Prophet Muhammad again is the illumination within Islam and is reflected by the artists in countless creations, whether it's in metal or in other, in other art. Finally, the other aspect of Islam uh, and metal which was closely connected with beauty. 
Islamic metal was the embodiment of beauty with its bold contrast of silver and the golden hues of the zinc, the zinc rich brasses which the Muslims perfected, and the dashes of stunning red copper creating an amazing arrangement of technicolor and again being for, for the metal of Islam's beauty and perfections and subli subliminal messages from Allah on the multiple levels of consciousness. And this ayah from the Quran al Karim, it, 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 nothing could say it better than this ayah how important metal is in, within Islam. Here Allah tells us that He gave us metal 1400 years ago. That metal was cast from basically the heavens or space or however you want to describe it. And even scientists will tell you now that metal, especially iron, is not from this earth. It's an extraterrestrial um, um, element. So, looking at the metal and in the future talks, what do what kind of questions arise? You know, in the in the coming talks, we want to discuss and we will be covering the uniqueness of Islamic metalwork, the advanced techniques of Islamic metalwork, including smelting and metal inlay and composition. The other thing we'll be covering is the skills of the artisans and their conditions of work and their literacy set levels. Were these people just poor people, artisans sat on the floor hammering away or did they have knowledge about what they were making? So these are questions that will be answered later. There's not enough time here to answer these kind of questions today, so there's a lot deeper the subject. The power of Islamic metal to become something to be desired even amongst non-Muslims in the early history and much later history. The plethora of designs of metalwork to be calligraphic, geometric, or the strangers of zoomorphic beasts and animals. And who were the patrons of Islamic metal? Who kind of sponsored the metal? That's another subject. That, that in itself will lead us to, to Cairo and why this metal is connected to Cairo. And the greatest pieces and why and how. And what was the significance of the Mamluks? a slave warrior group in relation to metalwork. And how, as I said earlier, why did Cairo become the epicenter of Islamic metalwork? Other questions that we will answer in later lectures or later on in this lecture will be, for example, why did Islamic swords and their metal composition strike fear in the hearts of the crusader enemies? In the search to create gold from lead and other base metals, did the Arabs find something of even more value to mankind rather than just looking for gold? And why in particular did the Arabs excel in metalwork? What role did metalwork play in the greatest mosques, palaces and the humblest of abodes? These are questions that we will tackle later. I will cut my section of the uh, talk short now because Dr. Amo will take over from me in a moment. But basically, the series of lectures will be in the next few months is about an art collection within my family which has been deemed important by art historians in the United Kingdom and in the United States. A forthcoming book about Islamic metalwork, which even though it will include Islamic metalwork from the early 10th century, and it will specialize on an epoch which has up to this day been largely ignored, which is the 1700s to the early 1800s. But there has always been an intellectual bias against Islamic metalwork and art, as I said earlier on. And this period was not seen as important, whether it be in architecture or classical cultural arts or poetry or philosophy. From the 1700s to the 1800s, this is forgotten by in Western academia. With this book and describing the medium of metal, we will show that this is not the case and that the Orientalist prejudices blinded Western scholars about the continuity of Islamic art. Because this is an important message that Islamic art continued. It didn't end with the Ottoman invasion of Egypt. It didn't end with the British invasion. It didn't end with the French, even Napoleon. It continued through the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, and into the 20th century. With this book, there will be many exhibitions of artifacts which we brought today, which you can look at later on and you can touch and and ask questions. I mean, these are only a small examples that we can we can take around. There'll be different ones at different venues. 
the book itself, it, the authors are Professor Muhammad Hamza Al Haddad, who's the Dean of Cairo University. There's a Professor Abdullah Kemal, Kemal, Head of Islamic History at Al Saud Ibn Aziz University, Riyadh. Dr. Peter Northover, he's the Head of Material Science at Oxford University, who's actually testing the metals for the composition and the specialities in dating. And the photography will be done by the world famous photographer of Islamic uh, art, uh, Peter Sanders. If you care to look at him on the internet, you'll see who Peter Sanders is. So this book is, is maybe a one to two year project that we've embarked on, and um, you know, we, we're hoping that Allah helps us to complete this uh, project. Okay, thank you. And uh, I will hand you over to uh, Dr. Eamon Salim. He will continue on more specialized parts of the, uh, the metal itself. Thank you. السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله Thank you very much Mr. Khalid for uh, your presentation and uh, I just wanted to share with you in this uh, first lecture that this metal work is from Mamluk, Egypt and we're not really celebrating the Mamluks, but we're celebrating the workers who did that work. Um, in Arabic, we say that people are like metal. You have strong people and you have weak people. And it's that combination of strength and illumination that produces beauty. It's the combination of strength of people and the light within their heart that can produce their beauty or emanate their beauty. Same thing for metal. Uh, the strength of metal and the elimination of metal can emanate that beauty. So first we're going to talk about strength. And what makes the metal stronger is when you melt it. And in Arabic, it's called fitna. يقال فتن المعدن إذا سهره بالنار ليختبر. And fitna is a very big topic, but it, in Arabic, it's very it's a very important premise for Muslims. It's test by trial and tribulation, good or bad. You can be poor, you can be rich, you can be strong, you can be weak, you can be healthy, you can be sick. The test is the same. And the answer is the same. The answer for Muslims is Alhamdulillah. And through that test, the weak becomes weaker and the strong becomes stronger. Same for humans, same for metals. And fitna was mentioned in the Quran in 64 places in the Quran. Um, and there are examples why fitna is worse than killing. Because if you're subjected to adversity and you're weak, you're gonna wish that you're dead. Because all the adversity would be around you and you're not strong enough to fend it. But if you're strong, adversity will make you stronger. And since the time of the Prophet والسلام, he was subjected to fitna from day one. People would throw dirt on his way going to the mosque. He was subjected to adversity, and from day one in Islam, adversity is making Islam and Muslims stronger. Only the strong Muslims become stronger, and the weak Muslims and the weak Muslims become weaker. And the Egyptian Mamluks arose from adversity. Two major events happened at the end of Harun al-Rashid time in 193 after Hijri, he had two children. Al-Amin, who was born of an Arabic mother, and Al-Ma'mun, who was born of a Persian mother. And at that point in time, they both were at odds. They were actually fighting. And for the first time in the history of Arabs from the Al Jazeera going out, 
into this like amazing journey and expansion of Islam, they realize that there is not enough Arabs and not enough warriors to cover this whole new territory. So another thing was happening in the steppes of Turkey and Central Asia, where it was very poor, it was arid desert, and actually parents were sending their children out into the desert with a bow and arrow because they didn't have enough food. There was not enough food to feed all the children. So what a father would do, after the child would be eight or nine, they would give him a bow and an arrow and tell him, you're on your own, go fend for yourself. And what happened is that nomadic, nomadic slave traders came and picked those children up. They were actually saved from dying in the middle of the desert. And those royal families, the Arabs that were in Baghdad, and Khorasan, they actually embraced those children, they brought them in, and they taught them Arabic, and they taught them Islamic religious teachings, till they were 12 or 14. Then they were taught the secrets of Arabian mastery, of horseback riding, archery, and other warfare, that great warriors like Khalid ibn al-Walid, or Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, were actually masterful in. And there were, these things were actually written down and passed from one generation to the other. So they were the non-Arabs that became Arabs. It took about 400 years or 450 years. They were expanded by the Fatimid, then the Ayyubid, till about 648 after Hijri, when they established the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt. And they actually transferred the Abbasid Caliphate that was decimated in Baghdad to Cairo at that point in time. Now we're going to discuss illumination, why the concept of illumination is important for both metal and Muslims. Allah is the light of heavens and earth, the light that you see not with your eyes, but with your heart or your inner core. The word light in Quran was mentioned in about 34 places. And it's all about the darkness that surrounds, not that surrounds us, but the darkness in our heart. Because Allah is all around us. So you have light all around you, but you have to tap into this light. And Quran is encouraging us, and Allah is encouraging us to tap into this light. And once you tap into this light, your heart will be full of Allah's light. And then you'll see things differently. And when your heart is full of Allah's light, the light will emanate from you, and then you'll see everything in the shade of that light, in the light of Allah. And I just want to mention the verse from Surah Al-Nur, where Allah describes Himself, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard, matalu nurihi kamishkatin fiha misbah, al misbah fi zujaja, al zujaja ka anha kawkabun durri yuqadu min shajratin mubaraka, zaytunatin la sharqiyatin wala gharbiya, yakadu zaytuha yudhi, wala ulam yam sashu nara, nurun ala nur. يَحْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَبْدْرُبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالُ لِلنَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ Once you have that light in your heart, there is something more that happens. That light emanates from your heart and goes in front of you. And there are many examples about that in uh, Quran. And here it says, That the light will be in front of you, and you'll see everything in this light. Again, one example after the other. And it's that interaction between strength, illumination, that comes beauty. And beauty is not just the worldly beauty. Muslims are always looking at the beauty in paradise. It's eternity. It's immortality. An example is this vase here that has the verse from Quran. 
it has the surah from Al Insan, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا إِنَّا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا فَوَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ شَرَّ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ وَلَقَاهُمْ نَضْرَةً وَسُرُورًا And they give food in spite of their love for it to the poor, the orphans, and the captives, saying, we feed you seeking Allah's countenance only. We wish you, we wish for no reward, nor thanks from you. Verily we fear from our Lord a day hard and distressful that will make the faces look horrible. So Allah saved them from the evil of that day and gave them the nadra and joy. And their recompense shall be paradise in silken garments because of the were patient. These are the artisans. They didn't just write the words of the Quran on metal. They actually did something more. They wanted us to feel that eternal beauty in paradise, what's expecting them, immortality, eternity. And that's actually a common theme in Islamic art. It's not just the calligraphy, but all of this geometric patterns where you start from one point and it goes on and on and on. And here, I just wanted to show the metal, and that you can see evidence of the little hammerings of the metal from people who are actually living and sitting in the dark alleys of Cairo. Educated, literate, knew about metal, knew about consistency, and they were really hammering away, hammering away. Another example, this is actually not a bowl, it's called sederiya. And this, uh, what early Muslims used to do wudu. And basically, um, this one is related to Sultan al-Islam uh, to Mumbai, and it says Sultan al-Islam as the Nasr, meaning um, his victory be glorified. And you can see, again, this is the back of it. And you can see it's as if the center medallion is like earth. And it's like heaven from the top. And how this perfection in the center, which is earth, is being watched from heaven. And you can see that the importance of I just wanted to show you this. Uh, it's actually a video where you can see the water shimmering, and they used it, they would put water in it, even though it's metal, it would not rust, but they would put water in it, and this water, if they're able to read the poetry, or whatever is in there, that means that the water is pure, and they can use this water to do a loop. If they can't read the writing inside, that means that the water is not clean, and they have to get pure water to do a loop. Again, this is another example of a box that has a combination of calligraphic panels and these, uh, what we call T, or T's. And uh, like uh, a friend of mine, you know, he describes this and that was uh, made by angels, not by average workers. But you can see the three metals here. You can see the copper, and you can see the silver, and you can see the brass. And the, actually, in between the T's, you can see what we call nylo, to give that stark effect, the darkness behind the silver. And at the same time, you know, I use the microscope in my surgery many times. And these 
workers did not have any magnification. They did not use any magnification. And you can look at the accuracy of this intricate detail of the T's and the arrows and how straight these lines are. And again, you can see up there the fleur de lay and the Islamic star, the two squares. Um, and again, the play with the eternal beauty, the, the perpetual, non-ending, geometric design that starts at one point and keeps going forever. And also for strength, the swords. Our ceremonial U.S. Navy sword is called the Memluk sword. And it was named after the Memluk swords. Because one of our commanders in the Navy went and helped in the Derna battle back in 1804. And he was given a Memluk sword as a gift. And since that day, our ceremonial Navy sword is the Memluk sword. It's not just strength. It's actually, it emanates beauty at the same time. So it's function and beauty. And you can see that this sword is actually a little bit ceremonial. It says, And you can see that three dots around the world, uh, around the calligraphic panel, and how important the three dots, or the number three in Islam, also, you can see around the end of this sheath, you can see dragons. And dragons actually meant good luck in Eastern culture. And you can see on the blade of the sword, we think that this blade was important, and actually the sheath and the handle were made for that blade. And you can see that it has the royal crosses on them, and that would indicate, you know, that there was some, were some encounters with the crusaders through that sword. And of course, candlesticks. The poor people, our forefathers, used the candlesticks and the, um, the candlesticks for, to emanate light all around them. But at the same time, they wanted to make sure that they were objects of beauty as well. And they were used to exalt the sultans, but at the same time they were used for other things. They were used to write poetry. Like this poetry on this candlestick, it's actually a romantic poetry by al Mutanabi. And it's a very uh, beautiful poetry. Again, you can see the combination of the metal, the silver, and the tumbuk, and how Muslims try to stay away from gold as much as possible, because gold has a bad connotation in Islam. But you can see that they were actually, they reached a level where they made the copper look like gold. And they can use it in the background without any kind of uh, vegetation, uh, just plain tumbuk, or they can use it as interacting with the silver. Also, this is the drip tray of the candlestick. And you can see on the drip tray, the animals on the drip tray. And that would ascertain that the caliph, or the sultan, is the sultan for humans and animals. And he is the shadow of Allah on earth. Not just for humans, but for animals and all plants as well, all living things. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Well, I... Uh, yeah, so I right there. <laughs> Go ahead. I just had a question regarding the, the connotation that you said gold has uh, traditionally in Islamic art, if you can elaborate on that. Um, gold for men, according, you know, for men, gold cannot be worn. It, it was looked down upon because it's like there's a hadith from the Prophet that the, if men would wear gold, 
It's like Jomratun uh, Minamnar. It's like having hot glowing, you know, ember from the fire. And that's why um, gold had a very bad connotation with metal workers. Um, and it, I think it was not challenging enough, but now when they were able to reach that level of sophistication with metallurgy, with coppers and silvers, they really didn't need gold. You know? The other thing, I'll, I'm not totally clear. The thing with gold is, as there's the little one about men wearing it, and the other thing was usage of silver and gold for utensils. Like there's a hadith as as I saw somewhere where a Sahaba he was given some water in a silver glass and he cast it aside. So what the metal workers did is you'll see that most of the metal like in there in this piece. I mean, and by the way, all these pieces you saw are in the collection. Uh, that piece you're looking at there that has gold in the middle. So to to illuminate. And especially if gold was given to mosques and, and to madrasas and silver, there's no problem. And you'll find that that's what we'll get to in the next talks. Because, as I said in, in my part of the, the talk, that there was, you know, how was this metal used in, in houses, for example? What did the common people use? Like Dr. Ingham, you mentioned the candlestick. He, he made a slight four par there. The candlesticks, that type of candlestick, were usually for the wealthy people. They were like, what would be today's equivalent, chandeliers. Whereas the poor people would probably have bronze or brass oil lamps, what you see in the Arabian Nights kind of thing, you know, the one that he rubbed, or clay ones. Because candles, especially the wax candles, in, a thousand years ago could be as expensive as the actual candle holder. That's how expensive they were. There's, there's two, I, I read an article where one sultan ordered uh, five, uh, he ordered 50 solid gold candlesticks, uh, 50 silver, 500 of those with the silver inlay, and he ordered uh, only 200 of candle wax candles because it was so expensive. So the, the thing with the gold is it had a bad, a bad kind of buzz about it, you know, in the sense that Allah it dislikes hoarding gold. But to beautify things, there's not been a real problem. So the, 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 you, you've got to look at what kind of gold objects are you looking at? But later on you'll find, and we'll get onto these talks later, gold was used. I mean, and the other thing is, in, in Islamic history, we don't bury gold with the dead. So the amount of gold surviving from historical items, there's very few items in the world, only what they found underground, for example. But if you look at, say, the ancient Egyptians, if we didn't find Tutankhamun's tomb, we would have never found that much gold. We would have never known that they had that much gold. So the gold was never buried with the Muslim tradition. It, you know, nothing's buried with the, when you die. So they, not, not much survived. And, you know. and the other thing too, I mean, if you look at that tray, you can see that this is gold, Hadam and Padla Rabbi. You know, but the effect of it is not as much as playing with the backgrounds, you know, of copper and tumbak and silver. It, it didn't add much to the coloring and the illumination of the, of the object itself. You know, so that's why um, I, I think it was later on when the Ottomans came, you know, they were not the yeah, the Mughal. Yeah, but I mean, talking about Islamic Cairo, it was not really a big deal. It's not like gold was not available. Gold was available. I think we, we were talking uh, about the story of a king from Maui that went to Hajj, and he had 1,100 camel loads worth of gold of gold dust, actually, that he came and bought stuff in Cairo. And that caused inflation for 10 years. He was from Africa, from Mali. From Mali. He actually was going to Saudi Arabia to do Hajj, and he had 100 camel loads of gold dust. And they were just like, you know, buying stuff with this gold. And that caused inflation in Cairo for the following 10 years. I mean, we're going to go into yeah, this uh, later on in other lectures, but, but gold, as regards metallurgy and metal and the illumination, I think the, the metal workers, at least from Egypt, you know, from Cairo, did not feel that it's that important. They can still give that luminance of the object without gold. I think they were very successful. Any more questions? Great. Uh, can I ask 
can we still find this artwork for these modern times, or are they? Uh, yeah, there, there, there is some uh, there is some work was happening in uh, Damascus and more in Cairo, maybe last 10, 15 years ago. Um, what's happened though is they mixed the the kind of the silver, especially they mixed it with aluminiums and. The technique of the, the inlay has changed, how it was actually inlaid into the metal. And, and the, the other thing is, you've got to remember, there's a tradition here, which was handed down family to family. Many of these pieces, like, for example, we have some door knockers, which are from a madrasa or a mosque. The, the same family would have made those from like the time of Saladin till the 19th century. Uh, so the families, the, the, as they People, of, you know, I was I was speaking to some people who did some of this work maybe in the 1930s or 40s. Um, I mean, I was a doctor even was saying, it, 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 and we want to get to this next time. It's an interesting fact that many of the guys who made these went blind early or lost sight because they didn't, didn't work in this kind of lighting or nothing. There's no kind of, uh, you know, but they did it with their pure beauty and and the, the master metal workers were really valued. But when the wars happened, when the Mongols came in, into Baghdad, many of those people were, were like kidnapped and taken back alive and, and made to work in, 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 in either in Bukhara or they, were, they went further um, uh, west uh, towards uh, uh, Syria and Cairo. And that's how the metal actually moved. Because the inlay technique started um, probably in Afghanistan, but it moved because of this. This is how much they were valued. And, 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 and the, as, you, as you were saying, the, 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 to make it nowadays, the problem is the, like, what verses do you put on? I mean, you could do Quranic script, would not be too difficult, but the poetry or the designs, I mean, in those designs, there's a lot of meanings, which is, there's no length or breadth of time really here to go into, but there's so many nuances on a singular piece. Like Dr. Raymond was saying, like, when they've got animals on there, that is to signify that the sultan was the ruler of everything. And some of the candlesticks, this is on the, uh, a candlestick with poetry. Some of them are um, like propaganda candlesticks, which say that Adil al Nasser, they say he's the ruler of the, the, the Muslims, he's the defender of the poor, the father of the poor, the fighter against injustice, a killer of the polytheists and the, Allah's enemies on earth. So these are propaganda candlesticks, which are used. You'll find those more from the time of, say, after the, about, uh, you know, the Mongols when they attacked, and they, they, they kind of represent the, the virtues of the, the sultan, you know, and the, and the powers that he had. So, so what's happened is nowadays to make those kind of pieces, unless you copy them directly, it, it would be difficult because people have lost that the techniques of what's behind the design. Like Dr. Emily mentioned that you know, in Islamic geometry. It starts at one point. The, the reason being, every Islamic geometry starts at a singular point because that's the representation of Allah. That everything emanates from Allah. And that's the, the science behind the geometry. That's why if you see, uh, you know, from the mosques to, to floor patterns or whatever, the, the, the geometry is always singular. It starts from a single point. So the, these kind of nuances whether some guy would know how to do those now, I, I, I doubt it. I mean, there is still, I mean, in Afghanistan, there is some reproductions I've seen with some silver in there, but again, they're copying from books, and they just say one thing, and they don't really have anything different. They might do different shapes, but the, and the quality is gone as well. To keep, as I was saying to yourself earlier on, all this metal work is done, the, the inlay of the silver and the copper is done in cold, cold metal. So, so there's no heat, there's no glue, it, and it's, if you look closely, you know, these things are hammered in and then they're kept straight. And if you try to, if I gave you a pen and paper and you try to write on those calligraphic panels, just to write it, you will struggle. So can you imagine what those guys have done in metal? I mean, that candlestick, in, in our estimates, that I'm talking to art historians in London, we, they reckon something like that could take you maybe one year to make that candlestick. And the bowls, they got work inside, outside. <laughs> You know, a long time. Uh, this will conclude the lecture for today. I think it was a great idea to uh, that it took us out of the uh, mentality of ISIS and, and uh, the fighting and uh, to, to talk about art and beauty. In Allah, 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 in
Uh, I would like to thank both of them, Dr. Ayman Salim, who is a neurosurgeon. Imagine a neurosurgeon talk about art. This is something uh, unique. And Brother Muhammad Khaliq, and I would like both of them to come back, inshallah, within eight weeks to give us another lecture. We really value the lecture. that we got them here, and on behalf of the board, I would like to thank you both. Thank you thank so much. You. I just want to add, you can touch the pieces, the children can touch them. We want them really to touch art, and touch things that our forefathers did, messages from the past. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.